Well, thank you so much. Good afternoon first. I, it's actually me who feels honored uh, by the invitation to come here and give the RSIS ST Lee Distinguished Annual Lecture at this place in Singapore, which you actually said, Ambassador Ong, that uh, you try to make sense of things. So we Europeans try to come to Singapore if we want to make sense out of Asian affairs. So I'm very happy to, to be here. I'm grateful and I want to express my thanks to the Rajaratnam School of International Affairs, to you personally, Deputy Executive Chairman of RSIS, Ambassador Ong, and also, of course, to Dr. Lee sang Ti and his foundation for making this visit possible. Now, the 32nd version of my presentation is basically this. Current geopolitical dynamics are putting enormous pressure on elements of world order which are particularly important, particularly vital for deeply internationally connected countries, particularly middle and smaller countries, such as countries of the European Union and also the Asian, ASEAN community. And if we in Europe and in the ASEAN community don't take the lead in defending and developing a rules-based order, no one else will do. So that's for those who are very busy, you can now leave. And uh, for the rest, here is what I'm going to do in the next 35 minutes or so. Uh, I will first sketch or try to sketch what I see as the two major or most concerning current geopolitical dynamics, which is a major power rivalries and some of its implications and side aspects, and b the pressures on liberal or more general rules-based order, so systems of order, and then second in the second step speak about what Europe and like-minded actors should do. But to begin with the general political trends, major power rivalry has clearly become the lead paradigm in debates about strategic challenges as well as in the real world. Now that doesn't mean that great power politics or great power conflict is all that counts or all that should concern us. But it has become the main frame for strategic attention, replacing earlier paradigms like the fight against terrorism, which has been with us for about a decade. And it has been marginalizing as a paradigm attention to other issues like development or sustainability, even though maybe that the latter sustainability has come back, uh, as we also saw at the G7 summit in Biarritz the other days, partly or mainly actually through societal pressure. While Europe, Russia, India all figure in debates about great power politics and great power competition, it's obvious that the real thing, the real rivalry is the one between the United States and China, and this rivalry dominates world politics today and much of the world's political concern. And this rivalry is likely to stay for a while. Uh, the US, as you all know, has officially, in official documents, declared China a, I quote, long-term strategic competitor, unquote, and China, or the Chinese elites, seem to be convinced, and I guess rightly so, that the US is trying to contain China, or at least contain China's further rise. Which means that trade issues, which are dominating the tweets of the US president, which are also dominant for bilateral negotiations and spats between Washington and Beijing, and which have the most uh, immediate impact on the world economy, that trade issues in the end are not the main item, may actually be the most easiest, or the easiest of the big issues to solve. What I want to say is that this strategic rivalry, as it's now been constructed, or as it's developing between Washington and Beijing, will remain even if the two capitals of Washington and Beijing should reach a trade agreement, which is not impossible. And if we, the rest of the world as it were, if we want to deal with this rivalry, if we want to deal with it politically and strategically, we must probably first understand and, and get analytically clear about what this rivalry actually is about, if it's not just trade, and I maintain it's not. So indeed, it seems to be a multi-dimensional constellation, 
which we're having here with at least five obvious dimensions. First, it's of course, it's rivalry, it's of course about the global balance of power and about status. If we listen to President Trump, who is more explicit than President Xi or President Putin or other major power leaders, if we listen to President Trump, it often seems as if superiority was an end in itself for him rather than a means to defend specific values or a certain vision of order. So that's the status rivalry, if you so wish. The second dimension, it's of course about security. And the security dilemma, the more one side increases its defenses or the defense of its defense capabilities of its allies, the more the other side feels threatened. And see, it is ideological or political. It's about the good political order. You could frame it as democracy versus authoritarianism. Probably not for President Trump, but certainly for the majority of US Congress. And then D, no doubt, it is about the economy, it is about trade, it is about currency, and it's particularly about technology and technological leadership, point I'll get back to in a second. Then E, fifth, it is about influence. Influence in other countries, regions, societies, you could call it soft power, but it's not always so soft. And thus, it is global. It is affecting regional dynamics all over the world and relations of either side with other powers and regions, as well as areas of global cooperation, such as the G20 or the UN. What it is not, I maintain, but there are some scholarly voices who would see it differently. What it is not is a replay of the Cold War for different reasons. Constellation is much more complex today than it used to be in what some of us call the good old Cold War. It wasn't so good, but uh, in hindsight we do forget. Um, other powers, like India, for example, have more to say today than they had in the Cold War times. Differences between the US, Europe, and Japan make it much more difficult today to find what we could call a Western or a common Western approach. And of course, the world is globalized. China, the US, Europe, and others are so deeply interconnected. And global connectivity generally makes it much less likely, I would say almost unconceivable, that a relevant number of countries would squarely position themselves in one camp or in the others, or would allow great powers to position themselves, as the Soviet bloc did, for example, in one camp or the other. And here we have something where societies and elites uh, probably have the same, the same attitude. Uh, societal actors, uh, who we used to see as consumers mainly today, seem to want Google and Huawei at the same time. They want the iPhone with Chinese components, or probably you could say Chinese characteristics. And state elites do want access to US arms and the Chinese market. They don't want either or. They want to have both. What I find remarkable, along with this current, I call it construction of great power rivalries, is that this rivalry also comes, or these rivalries, it's actually a multitude of rivalries, also come along with an increasing, with an increasing politicization or geopoliticization of both infrastructure and technology. We see that particularly in the current disputes about 5G and how to deal with Huawei and other Chinese technology firms, a dispute we are having in the US and between the US and Europe and Australia and other places or the discussion whether certain firms should be banned from US technology inputs or should be allowed to invest in Europe. We also see it, which I find quite interesting, was a stronger, much more securitized focus on, among other things, the relevance of seaports and who manages them, electricity, networks, gas pipelines. In Europe, that is mainly about Russia, but could be about other operators and other parts of the world, investments in the Arctic or in Greenland or who could buy it, for example, issues already triggering disagreements between the US and, for example, the UK, Germany, or even Israel, which demonstrates that, and, and this is what I find interesting analytically, which demonstrates that as much as we live in a digital age, politics and geopolitics is still very much about 
the physical basis of global connectivity. Everything may be digitalized, but not everything is virtual or in the digital realm. It always is there on the ground, and that is what conflicts are often about. Now, notions such as technological and economic decoupling, barriers to the free flow of goods, of investment, or of knowledge, aren't exactly expressions of a liberal economic order, probably more an expression of limited self-confidence. Which brings me to the second trend I want to speak about, namely pressures on liberal, but also more generally on rules-based systems of order. These pressures are partly structural, already mentioned, uh, great power competition. We should add shifting balances of power in the world, which is closely connected. And of course, technology itself and digitization, which are all structural factors, if you so wish. But they're also partly actor-induced, particularly by political leaders who see insecurity, of course, the insecurity of others, and unpredictability as an asset and rules as an obstacle. It's certainly so that the emphasis on great power politics, great power competition in political rhetoric as well as in practice comes at the expense of some of the normative principles which we usually associate with the rules-based or the liberal international order. And sometimes I feel when I speak to audiences in my own country, I'm not sure that's true here too, then I have to repeat what some of these principles actually are. So what is it about? What are the principles of a liberal or a rules-based order? For example, just to remind us all, the respect for each country's sovereignty and the inadmissibility of territorial acquisition by force. Think Ukraine, think even the Golan Heights, think other places. Free trade, of course, according to common rules and under common institutions. Think the WTO and how it is being are handicapped by some actors. Commitment to arms control regimes and other international treaties. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Common obligations to protect the global commons or international humanitarian law and human rights law. All this is part of the normative principles which we associate with the post-World War II international rules-based order. And it's no wonder that such norms are coming under pressure with the resurgence of nationalism and the rise of illiberal leaders even in democratic states, such as the United States, Hungary, Brazil, Poland, Turkey, and a couple of others, who often scorn multilateralism and openly dismiss international institutions, or to put it very mildly, at least don't invest much in the defense of these principles. Now, we shouldn't personalize international politics too much. Um, it's easy to speak about President Trump. And he makes himself an easy, um, an easy object to speak about. Uh, it's probably not as easy to speak about Putin and Xi and others. But I guess we have to be clear that all these leaders haven't fallen from the sky. Uh, they are there because certain societal and political structures have allowed them to come there. But still, I'm not going to personalize, but particularly from a Western, particularly from a European perspective, it's deeply worrying that the United States under President Trump seems to be withdrawing from or undermining institutional agreements and institutions which partly at least form core elements of the liberal international order. And to add to that, and that's even more important, I guess, for a European view, that the US under President Trump is withdrawing from our undermining institutions that wouldn't even be there had it not been for the initiative and the leadership of the United States in the past. That goes for the WTO, that goes for the UN Human Rights Council, that goes for UNESCO, that goes for the Arms Trade Treaty, that also goes for, as you know here in Asia, for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it goes for the Paris Agreement, or it goes for the GCPOA, the uh, Iran nuclear deal. Uh, we could say it also goes for the European Union, which wouldn't be there in the way it is had it not been for decades-long support of the United States. Today we learn from President Trump that the EU is worse than China. And what can actually be worse than China for the US president? I'm not sure. Probably the uh, 
head of the US Federal Reserve and Europe. Now, the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, to just uh, dwell on this one example, is of course not only a US affair with short-term political benefits, perhaps, and long-term costs to the US and others. And so much in international relations, in international politics, is actually about emulation and looking at what your peers, what other states do. Such a withdrawal signals to others that it's okay to walk away from national commitments, national obligations to global common goals and goods, global common goals and global goods, and it substantially reduces the peer pressure which a country like Brazil, for example, or Australia or others may anticipate with regard to their own dealing with jointly set goals and rules. One more aspect at this point, uh, which for security and international relations institute is quite important in a different policy area. In the past, and here I'm actually speaking of the Cold War, arms control has helped to mitigate great power rivalry and stabilize the international situation a lot. At current, however, it seems that international security and arms control agreements seem to constitute a particularly vulnerable part of the rules-based order. We have seen in Syria, for example, and thank Ambassador Ong for mentioning that I was active there on the diplomatic front with the UN. We have seen in Syria, for example, how the worldwide ban on chemical weapons, which all relevant states have subscribed to, all without exception. In the Syria war, we have seen how the worldwide ban on chemical weapons has been undermined without the US and Russia being able to agree on protection or on enforcing that ban since 2016. We just had to witness it this month the demise of the INF Treaty, a landmark US-Soviet and US-Russian treaty on banning land-biased, land-based missiles of intermediate range. It seems, I think it's quite obvious, that neither the Russian nor the US leadership had a strong interest in preserving this treaty, which they saw as tying their own hands, but not those of others. Recent missile tests of the US, but also of Russia, and statements to the effect that the U.S. considers the deployment of intermediate-range missiles in the, in the Indo-Pacific demonstrate to me that the unraveling of the INF Treaty, which originally was concluded in order to stabilize the European theater, is not a European or a NATO-Russia affair. Rather, what we learn from it, as scholars, is that the end of any arms control regime, whatever its original regional scope, will have global effects, will affect other regions too. And therefore, I think that the same repercussions beyond the own region, that the same repercussions, the same effects might be seen if the GCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, was officially declared dead, which is a not yet or not totally. We could add to the list pressures on arms control regimes and treaties the withdrawal of the United States from the Arms Trade Treaty, or the risk that the US-Russian New START Treaty on strategic nuclear arms would not be extended in 2021. Now, to be clear, none of these developments which I sketched means that new nuclear arms would necessarily be deployed tomorrow anywhere. But all these agreements in the past have increased transparency which is an important good in arms control, and been important elements of strategic stability. And that demise, the end of any such, or all these arms control regimes, will certainly not give incentives to countries like China or India or Saudi Arabia or others to talk about and negotiate new arms control regimes that would tie themselves down. Nor does any of these developments bode well for the forthcoming NPT review conference next year. Rather, I think what we have to worry about is a perspective of an end of arms control as we have known it for more than half a century. I admit or I suspect that this may be a European concern rather than a nation concern. 
but I also maintain that lessons from the European theater may become more relevant to Asia the more the center of geopolitical gravity is located in this region in the Indo-Pacific. I'm not going to deal here with uh, what we could call regional reflections of these dynamics, dynamics which I've sketched, uh, be that in the South China Sea, or between Japan and Korea, India and Pakistan, or in the Middle East, or in Africa, at least about some of them I could rather learn from you than tell you anything new about them. My overall hypothesis, and that may be debated, is that we will not walk into a divided world order, as we had it in the Cold War, but rather witness the continuous progressive formation of a rather unbalanced multipolar system with four or five global poles, each with different powers of attraction. Power of attraction is what a pole has. And a world which is also polarized on regional levels in the Middle East, in South Asia, East Asia, Africa, and other places, with repeated disputes about rules and norms, fragmented regional security architectures, but still a thick level, thick net of multilateral or global institutions and regimes that, however, need the active support of those who have the strongest interest in legitimate rules-based structures and institutions. For Europe, and here I come to my second part, second part of this presentation, for Europe, the issue of great power rivalry has, of course, historically and geographically not been connected to China, but always been the subject of European, Russian, or non-Russia, Europe, and Russia relations, our relations with Russia. Up to 2014, only five years ago, most Europeans would have taken the post-Cold War pan-European security order for granted, which the so-called Paris Charter of 1990, which many called founding charter of the new post-Cold War Europe, actually has called the European order of peace with actors coming together from Vancouver to Vladivostok, as we often said. The Russian annexation of the Crimea Peninsula in 2014 and the ongoing war in Ukraine have changed that, taking the order for granted now most likely, these moves were not intended to destroy this pan-European order, but they have certainly tested it very, very severely. Now, Europe still possesses, even since 2000, after 2014, Europe still possesses the most highly institutionalized regional order in the world, with a host of overlapping regional institutions and dense cooperative frameworks that encompass both the European Union and its member states and non-EU states, including Russia. And some of these institutions, like the Council of Europe, with its European Court of Human Rights, actually have jurisdiction or de facto jurisdiction over what most states would consider their internal affairs. So we could say the order, still, the order is still there, and the institutions still do their work, and that is correct, but at the same time, trust between states, between leaders, has been lost, and Russia has actually demonstrated to its fellow Europeans that geopolitics and military power still count, even inside our peaceful continent of Europe. Now, generally, Europe, and I'm using Europe here shorthand for the EU and its member states, Europe is particularly concerned about geopolitical uncertainty and threats to order or global order. Order is very much in our DNA, I think. And this even more so since the relationship with our most important allies, the United States, is itself fraught with uncertainty. But make no mistake, if I speak so much about the United States here, Europe doesn't question its alliance with the United States, and it certainly doesn't want to entrust its security or guarantees for our European way of life to any other power. It is realizing though, Europe I mean, it is realizing though, and here I'm quoting Angela Merkel, that, quote, the era where we could fully rely on others is gone, unquote. Differently put, Europe has to understand, and I think it understood, 
that it needs to build up its own capabilities, to develop its own strategic autonomy, as some say, or its European sovereignty, both to deal with global challenges, to cope with crises in its own strategic environment, and to build a more symmetric partnership with the United States. Footnote to this letter remark, um, whenever we speak about a more symmetric partnership with the United States or building up our own capabilities autonomously, uh, this usually leads to misunderstandings with U.S. counterparts. Um, but I think what a British colleague said is correct, and I'm going to quote him because I couldn't say it better. The United States doesn't like talk of strategic autonomy in Europe, and I could add among any of its allies. The United States doesn't talk doesn't like talk of strategic autonomy in Europe, but unless Europe becomes more capable, U.S. interest to invest itself in European security will continue to wane. I think he is right. Unless we build our own capabilities, we will not be able to guarantee that the United States stays with us. So Europe is also realizing, and here I return to my previous thought, that almost by default, it needs to step up its effort to maintain and defend international rules and rules-based systems of order. And this, in contrast to what some Chinese or Americans may think, this interest to uphold rules-based system is not idealism. It's not even a matter of choice. Rather, for a deeply internationally connected country, like my own, like Germany, or for the EU in its entirety, and for most other smaller and middle powers, legitimate and sustainable rules and structures of order constitute a vital interest. It's not a choice, it's not idealism, it's a vital interest. Because in a purely power-based world, we would inevitably lose. Germany and France, actually the marriage between these two is much better than uh, what many journalists assume, as in many marriages, so seen from inside, it's more interesting perhaps, but uh, it also works very well. The Germany and France have therefore decided to launch what they call an alliance for multilateralism at the United Nations General Assembly this year, together with countries like Canada and Japan and Mexico and a couple of others, with the aim to underline their common commitment to multilateralism and support the development of the rules-based order. Now, this is a worthy goal, and I'm all for it, but I will still make some three somewhat critical remarks as part of a necessary and constructive debate about such initiatives. First, or a, any such initiative, Alliance for Multilateralism, needs to be very, very concrete. I'll get back to that at the end of my presentation. Lofty declarations in defense of multilateralism are very European indeed, and they are okay, but they do not by themselves constitute multilateral action. And concreteness, specificness, is the more important today because too many states are actually claiming support for multilateralism once they work together with one or two others to pursue their individual or unilateral interests. China does so with great emphasis. I mean, listen to the current rhetoric in Beijing. It's all about defending multilateralism, but I think they mean something different from what we mean, namely, and if you read the fine line, it's actually in there, they're quite transparent, to oppose what they call U.S. unilateralism. That is, their multilateralism is in pursuit of their rivalry with the United States, not in order to be, to be tied in by common rules or systems of order. So we have to be very concrete if we want to lay out to others what we mean with multilateralism. Be an alliance for multilateralism also needs to address the interests of states that aren't content with preserving international structures of order, but want to change and develop them, not least with regard, of course, to voting structures voting rights in international, or, or, uh, organiza in international organizations. I fully understand that countries like India, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico are not happy with simply maintaining, keeping the current multilateral institutional landscape as it is. And C, and that may be another debatable point, 
words and concepts matter a lot, and using the right concepts can help to avoid the impression that the real purpose of such an alliance is a maintenance of a Western order or an order dominated by Western democracies. It's uh, understandable, I guess, I hope, that in Europe, in America, in Japan, uh, we usually, in our debates, emphasize, emphasize the liberal world order, emphasis on the word liberal, often today with sort of a notion of regret that the United States, which so clearly has been shaping this liberal order, now seems to be walking away from it. The label liberal world order indeed characterizes a mainly US-inspired US-led system built after 1945, you all know that, including the entire UN system with all its organizations and conventions, the US-led alliance system all over the world, and a general orientation towards economic and political freedom, human rights, rule of law, democracy. This liberal order has seen its high time after the end of the Cold War, where we thought it would become universal, but it has also become compromised by certain military interventions which partly were being legitimized as forms of democracy promotion or protection. Think Iraq 2003, but also French-led Libya 2011. And the fact is that not everybody in the world, not all states and political elites, elites that would be needed to uphold and develop effective multilateral structures will subscribe to liberal elements, which say, rightly or wrongly, I would say wrongly, regard as potentially undermining state control, domestic stability or sovereignty. I actually think that they are wrong, that liberal elements in domestic and international orders don't undermine sovereignty, but unfortunately what I think is not really relevant for the state of international relations. The diplomatic art of the possible for liberal democracies, like my own, would be, therefore, to build up as inclusive as possible a coalition of like-minded actors to promote what I would call international rule of law, but not make the liberal order the enemy of a rules-based one. Saying that, and I know that I will get some flack for my own country here, but all this is not about so much what we believe about domestic order, it's about what we can achieve internationally. Personally, I'm confident and convinced that liberal democracy will prevail, that it, or because it provides the best available and most sustainable domestic order, and also the one which preserves human dignity much, much better than any other domestic order. But to demand and to maintain and develop international rules and international systems of order, we will need a broader spectrum of actors, including both states and elites that subscribe to and that don't subscribe to democratic and liberal values. And this includes, of course, and here I think the European perspective, which I'm supposed to give, is a bit different from at least the mainstream or the administration's American perspective, this includes that our strategic approach to China, with all the disputes, grievances, and fundamental differences we have, that our strategic approach to China should always include an open invitation to find sustainable and common routes. Concretely, and I promise that at the end of my presentation I would become concrete, concretely, such an approach would involve efforts not only to preserve international agreements and institutions such as the WTO, Paris Agreement, the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas, the GCPOA and others, but develop new initiatives such as, which we're already beginning or have already begun to do, build climate policy coalitions that go beyond nation states or initiate, to give just a few examples, talks about yet unregulated areas of, of our globalized world, yet unregulated areas of our globalized world such as cyber, outer space, new weapons, particularly autonomous weapons, artificial intelligence, data use and protection. We just discussed over lunch what it actually means from a European perspective if the Chinese state asks pilots and 
service personnel on an international airline to hand over their mobile, phone, their mobile phones when they land in China. I mean, we have here definitely an attempt by one country to set international standards about data protection or data unprotection, if that is a word, and therefore I think it is up on us to think about what norms and standards actually could and should apply when we speak about data flows, data protection, and data use. At least by initiating such discussions, such talks, we will contribute to broaden the international body of norms, build normative frameworks, as it were, that can get traction through peer pressure and example, as actually previously has happened with issues in the arms control field, like uh, cluster ammunition or landmines, which were started by smaller countries against the will of the big boys, as it were, or issues um, around the sustainability uh, aim, global health, poverty, or environmental protection. At best, if we are more lucky here, we would establish ground rules, which eventually could be accepted even by powers that currently are not interested. So we cannot do wrong by starting these discussions, even though the international climate doesn't seem to be support, too supportive for it at the moment. Now, nothing will be perfect. Multilateralism and international rule of law will always be work in progress. However, and that is my last sentence, if we, EU nations, ASEAN nations, and some other middle and smaller powers, don't begin the debate and the walk, don't take the initiative, no one else will. Thank you very much for your attention.